Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Good evening, and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Lindsay Whitehurst, journalist with the Associated Press, Robert Gerke, news columnist with the Salt Lake Tribune, and Chris Blake, lobbyist with RRJ Consulting. Thank you for being with us today. We're gonna to jump right in. This is the time of after the legislative session where the governor starts you know, deciding on, what, on all the bills and we start having ceremonial signings. And I wanna start with one that was big this week. So let's start with you, Lindsay. The governor finally signed the hate crimes bill uh, this week, uh, over, just over an hour long. There were tears, there was joy. Based on what we saw right there on this, why did it take so long for us to get to this point as, as a state? You know, there were there were a few factors as, as there was some pushback over the years. It had kind of stalled out. Um, a, one of them, you know, there, there are critics who feel like this could potentially um, hurt freedom of speech or, or mm -hmm. you know, people are being punished for their thoughts rather than their actions. And, and others who say, um, look, enhanced penalties don't necessarily prevent crime. That's that's what we've been looking at with criminal justice reform. So so those critics were certainly out there. But um, but by the end of it, um, we're very much uh, outnumbered by the people who said, if, if nothing else, this sends a very important message that, that crimes and violence targeting a certain group of people that send fear through whole groups of people, we are not gonna tolerate that in Utah. And um, and so so there were a few twists and turns this took along the way. Um, one year um, with, that's often cited, uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints made a statement kind of urging, urging folks not to upset a balance between LGBT and religious rights. This came right after the, the big anti-discrimination bill in 2015. And, and supporters uh, of, of the hate crimes bill said that statement really damaged their chances and basically ended it at, at that year. And then, um, then the, the church after that really didn't say much at all publicly about this um, and until this year when, um, when they clarified, we do not oppose this. And, um, and after that, um, that along with a, a brutal beating at a tire shop in Salt Lake City of a Latino yeah. man, those two things together kind of really helped, a momentum had already been building, and then those two big events really got it over the top. Mm -hmm. Rob, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think one of the important things to recognize here, and this is important in any legislative uh, policy that gets passed, is you need a champion, somebody that is really passionate and focused on it. And that's where I give Senator Thatcher real credit on focusing on, the, being laser focused on it. I'm not even sure he ran another bill, but, but he was so focused on this and really was was the individual to push it across the top. And that's what you need in legislative politics is somebody that's going to champion that all the way through the process mm -hmm. to make something happen. He really was relentless in, in, in meeting with the senators, trying to get a hearing on it, because it looked for a while like it might not actually get a hearing in the Senate. Mm -hmm. When it finally did, it passed fairly easily. But I think what Lindsay hit on with the church's position changing, I think really was a, big, a, a deal breaker, frankly, because for a long time there had been a Perception, right or wrong, that the church opposed this, and and that was a, a perception that just stopped the discussion. I think when they came out and said we're not opposed to it, then you started seeing all these discussions being had. You started seeing refinements to the bill that weren't happening before, and you started seeing President Stuart Adams get behind it, and and you, you know, and then when it made it to the House, I think uh, Representative Perry, the House sponsor, said he expected it to get maybe 38 to 40 votes, and it got over 60 by the time it passed, and so it passed overwhelmingly. Um, I think you know the governor. Got commented on what a great day it was for the for the state. I thought it was kind of striking too that you had Senator Derek Kitchen and Governor Gary Herbert, who were the two parties in Kitchen v. Herbert, which was a same-sex marriage lawsuit years ago, speaking on this on the same issue. They've come together on this now. And so, you know, prosecutors are looking forward to being able to use this power of uh, this authority if it if need be. As Lindsay mentioned, the tire shop beating mm -hmm. was was a key one that that I think played into this pretty dramatically as well. So, um, you know, it's it's it was a, a good day for all around. It was. I want to read a graphic to you, a statement from uh, Representative Patrice Arendt, who sort of encapsulated this because this story that wasn't just here in, in Utah, the, the fact that we passed this went nationwide. Uh, here's what she said. Until today, it has been a failing of our state 
to allow people to commit a crime motivated by hateful belief without serious consequences. Today, that ends. Today, we come together as a state to hold accountable those who commit crimes in the name of hate. Chris, you, you talked about what, what an advocate, what we had in the legislature too, but how is this representing who you're talking to in the community? Is this rectifying that, that, that belief in the state and is this finally in line with where, where Utahns are? Uh, I believe it absolutely is. I think it's important that uh, the state, which uh, it, we take our image very seriously. I'm a born and raised Utah. Uh, I think we, we how we reflect ourselves to a broader population has always been something that's important to us. Maybe even a little bit, we feel a little bit persecuted. And so I think it is important as we take these steps. Lindsay mentioned the 2015 law. I think these are important steps, uh, both for Utah as a whole, as well as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I think that as these images are important uh, to both a national and broader global audience. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the regional director for the um, Anti-Defamation League who mentioned that, that this has been noticed in states like Indiana and Georgia kind of considering similar laws that, that when, um, when they see another state that's also a conservative state mm -hmm. taking this on, it, it can, it can kind of make a difference in some of those debates. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit to some vetoes uh, as opposed to the signings. One of these, Robert, let's talk about, which is interesting. The governor has line item veto authority over some budget items. That's one of the powers that the governor has. And he exercised it on an $800,000 appropriation. What was that? Give us the politics of what was going on there. Well, so it was a sound wall that uh, that a certain uh, developer, Bryson Garbett, had gone around UDOT to get this wall built out by his property. And uh, Bryson Garbett, Garbett Homes, you're probably familiar with, uh, he said there's there were walls on either side of his property. He wanted one here. He could he wasn't able to get it. He went and hired a lobbyist. Chris knows about how this works. Um, you you go hire a lobbyist and you get this tucked into the bill. It was eight hundred thousand um, dollars. The governor said he saw, part of the reason he vetoed it was the description in the bill was actually incorrect. It said it was on, I believe it said it was on uh, Mountain View Corridor and mm -hmm. it was on Bangor Highway or maybe vice versa. Um, it, but there was also a little bit of consternation about the way it happened. Instead of going through the normal process of, of getting these things prioritized and built, it was, you know, just stuck right into the appropriations bill at the last minute. And so that was, that was one of the few vetoes he used this year. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for a second, since you mentioned Chris, you were the chief of staff for the speaker of the House, you had to work through these sort of the, these, these special appropriations for a long period of time. But describe that process for just a little bit, how something like this happens and then, you know, just... Well, and I'll say this, I think Utah, and I, I, I would assume the reporters, maybe they'll back me up, maybe they'll, they'll counteract this, but I think Utah has a pretty transparent legislative process. Now, there certainly are things that can be put into bills, but they have to be voted on that this was pretty clear in terms of what its purpose was, even if it was mistakenly listed on the wrong road. Um, and so it does give people a chance to, to look at that. Uh, you know, I, for, as a lobbyist, I, I certainly think that it's appropriate that people go and do this. I don't know the politics that happened at UDOT, and certainly something that uh, Bryson feels strongly about. And uh, he, he hired a, a good lobbyist to get that done. But uh, this is part of the process, and I'm sure the, the conversation will go on. But it's certainly something that's there, and uh, it, it's a part of the process. But it's pretty transparent, generally, in terms of what's being funded and, uh, and what's in those bills, and so that mm -hmm. people can look at that and have an understanding of what the legislature your past. I think it is and it isn't. I mean, some of the, it'll always say, you know, it said here, it's a sound wall, right? And so we also, it was a sound wall. You don't really understand the, all the nuance. You don't understand the, what led up to that, who's proposing it, who's got the, who's mm -hmm. hired which lobbyist to get it in there. And so there, it is, it is in there, but there's always more digging you've got to do. Well, when this one, the press kind of started talking about My story. colleague Lee Davidson wrote about it, I think, and it, it brought some attention to it. I mean, it may have been on the governor's radar screen before that. I don't know. I hope, I hope the governor reads mm -hmm. the Salt Lake Tribune but <laughs> who, who doesn't, yeah, anyway, right. of course. Uh, well, let's talk about so, uh, one more funding item, Lindsay, with you, because as we ta start talking about money that did go to things, I want to talk about s something it didn't go to. The 2020 census, mm -hmm. this is just an interesting story. We have that coming up uh, mm -hmm. soon for the state, and um, you know, some states are spending a lot of money. Their advertisements, education, saying you've got you to be counted so we can get another seat. Why, uh, why are we not spending money on any of that here in the state? You know, that's a good question. I mean, those numbers are important. They, they certainly, they can determine funding. They, they, they can determine a lot of different things. And so, so, and there is some, 
the census has been perhaps a little more controversial lately in the past. There's this uh -huh. whole question, will there be a citizenship question on the census yes. and things like that. And I think there's a concern uh, among some people that that could make people more reluctant to participate, to actually stand up and be counted. Mm -hmm. and, and that could have a real effect. So I think that's part of the reason why you see some states investing in it. And um, and so so perhaps in, in Utah, they, there's not as much of a, of a concern that there might be an issue yeah. there. But, um, but it's certainly something that's been in a lot of people's minds in the yeah. Country. And, and something I think that's interesting that uh, is, it's my understanding that the census will be done online. And so the, getting people to actually participate in that is sort of more, it's not the normal way that we have mm -hmm. done this. Because I don't ever remember states having to spend money on this. And so it's, it's perplexed me a little bit why this has become such an issue. Is it the citizenship question? Is it making sure people actually get counted online? Maybe Utah doesn't care because we're not in looking or in line to get a new yeah. congressional seat? I mean, is that really just the only issue? Or I don't know. What do you think, Robert? Because we got a seat in 2011. Yeah, I think that's part of it. We're not on the cusp of going one way or another on a congressional seat, but there is still there are still funding issues at play here. And, you know, I wrote about this before in the context of, we there was a lot of money spent on a lot of different pet projects, pork barrel projects, frankly, and and the, and the Democrats in particular were pushing to get some additional funding for the census for the census count, and they weren't able to get it. They sent they spent money to get wolves delisted, even though we don't really have wolves in Utah. They spent money on you know golf golf tournaments and air shows and things like that, but there's just not enough money to get this sort of the fundamental question about how many people actually live and reside in Utah and how who who receives services from the government. I think. It it's kind of disappointing that they weren't able to do that. I think Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County in particular are, are, are putting some of their own money into right. making sure that they get this to try to step in and fill that void. But uh, you know, the census, it's every 10 years. You do it, you do it right. You, you want to hope, you hope you do it right. Um, and so you get the best numbers possible. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, a, a big national uh, uh, position which was taken by the Trump administration with the state of Utah, Lindsay, uh, Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. So we requested some waivers from the state and we had a, a grant, a part of one of our requests. What was, what was the request and let's talk about the outcome. So this was kind of the first step, and this was the one um, that was kind of widely considered the easy part, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> relatively right. speaking. Um, and and so what this will this will allow a rollout to continue on April one, even though it's a little bit different um, or a lot different from uh, the law the voters approved and what um, the way it was kind of laid out under Obamacare. And so um, so this wasn't considered to be as difficult because the state is still paying for 30 percent of it. Mm -hmm. The state's t still paying their typical portion of it. What will be really closely watched, I think, nationally is is when it this spring, probably mid-May sometime, will uh, Utah will do another waiver to kind of keep this program going the way we want to, covering fewer people, but still getting the, the federal government to pay 90 percent instead of the 70 mm -hmm. they have. That's been. part two. Yes. The more difficult so part that'll of this. be that'll be really interesting to see, and so uh -huh. uh, so so yeah, that that next part Utah's asking for a few unique things, so we'll see how that goes. Uh -huh. Robert, one of the unique things uh, is what some other states have tried to do. There's this work requirement. Right. So a couple courts just this last week struck those down. A couple days later, the administration gives a pat gives the okay to that. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big fight, frankly. Um, you know, as Lindsay mentioned, the the the. The 70-30 split, uh, for the initial waiver that we got on, I think, the, the very last minute on March 31st or something like that, was the easy one because, of course, the federal government's going to say, you, yeah, if you want to pay three times as much to, you know, per patient, sure, go ahead and do that. Knock yourselves out because that's you know, the state's going to be covering three times as much uh, on that end. But this this work requirement is going to be a big fight, and and you mentioned the court rulings. Um, you know, there there's some question about whether that just it, unfairly moves people off of Medicaid. Uh, you know, the proponents of it, the legislature has said, well, we want people at least looking for a job or getting some job training, and you know, and so so that's sort of the tension there. And I think, as Lindsay also mentioned, this this uh, question about the 90-10 the split for c covering only 100% up to the poverty level is gonna be a, a big fight because they haven't really done that anywhere else. And I think if Utah, if they grant that to Utah, it opens mm -hmm. the door for all of these others to come in. And then there's a, a, per, a, a, a cap on on, you know, once we reach a certain level, we're not going to enroll anybody else. Again, they haven't done that, so we're kind of in some uncharted waters there. Mm -hmm. From a political perspective, though, I think Republicans really have to wake up because health care is seen as a, whether it's a fundamental right, but certainly a fundamental need. And anytime somebody goes to the hospital and deals with, you know, even something minor, they're, they're, they are concerned about this issue. And so Republicans don't have a good position. President Trump suggested that 
you know, they would come up with, you know, the greatest plan ever. And so if they don't uh, figure out what their position is on this, other than now being against Obamacare, which has been the position for a long time and has, I guess, been successful politically, but is not a long-term policy position. And so I see that, you know, Senator Romney said he's working on something, obviously helped kick a number of things off, particularly from a Utah perspective with his plan in Massachusetts. But Republicans have to get serious about this issue and have something that they can give to the people. Well, let, let's, let's address a couple of these issues, because it's true. Just this week, we got President Trump, at least initially, saying, Affordable Care Act, we're, we're taking that on again, right? Repeal that again. And then out pops what, kind of what Chris was just alluding to, even Mitt Romney. Maybe he's going to rise based on his experience in Massachusetts and something for the country. T talk about that for just a moment, because Mitch McConnell came out immediately and said, not so fast. Yeah, that, there's there's been some back and forth on this. And, and I think it seems like his perspective is a little bit more like McConnell's, I mean, a little bit this is this is not our issue. This is a this is a, a big complicated issue, yeah. and and this is not necessarily one we should take on. And it seems like perhaps the president is 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 waving more towards that point of view, um, or at least until after the 2020 election, when there that, yeah. that's when the the big grand plan will come out. And um, that is something that's been a big issue for Democrats. It's it's seen as a big issue that that helped them retake the House. And and so you can definitely understand why why the president would would want to say we we yeah. should we should be more present on this issue, but also it is big, it is complicated, and it is it is extremely tough to, to deal with as a country. So, well, Robert, that is so. In oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think I think it's being teed up for 2020. Uh -huh. I think I don't know that the president necessarily has any clue what the White House wants to do in terms of reforming health care or replacing Obamacare with something else. I also think. Uh, as Chris kind of alluded to, I think politically it's it's Obamacare has gained acceptance nationwide because it's it's actually done some good things for people. And so you know you've got these attorneys general from all these different states in this Texas lawsuit that are trying to get Obamacare struck down um, and and seem to be pretty far down that path. They're in the appeals court now. And, uh, you know, I, but I think if, if that does go away, the question becomes, what do you replace mm -hmm. it with? Because a lot of people now are, are, are like what, they, what they've seen from Obamacare. And so, so, you know, the president is making this a political issue for 2020, but I think it, it's a dangerous political issue because you have to be able to deliver the goods when, it yeah. come, when push mm -hmm. comes to shove. Uh -huh. Chris, this, I want just one more question on this political side of it, too, because that's true. If this becomes an issue, the 2020 election, we know in the last election, this was one of the big issues, right? I think the Republicans said this is, they, they came into office, I think Lindsay was just saying this too, based on this idea. Uh, you know, if, if they're saying, let's wait till after 2020, does that signal the Republicans don't want this to be the issue well, they're I, talking I, about? I certainly don't think they want it to be the issue that, that, that people are talking about. Uh, and But I think it goes back to more of a fundamental issue of where is the policy making? Where is the Republican Party headed? They're clearly divided. Trump has changed the way the party approaches policy making. We have, I think, more serious politicians here in Utah that like to, to, to really focus on the policy. But there's not a policy making apparatus that's really developing. This is what the Republicans stand for right now. And that could be a problem for them in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, one other issue that is already being discussed as 2020 issue, Robert, is immigration. Uh, the president started out this last week saying I'm shutting down the southern border, kind of backed off that a little bit. Where, where is that playing in the discussion, both nationally and here in the state? Well, I think, you know, the, the president is concerned about his base and, you know, he's he's made the wall and the immigration and shutting down the border prime issues because that, I think that resonates well with the base that he knows that he's got to get out uh, in 2020. I don't know that it necessarily helps everybody else on the ticket, all everybody who's running for Senate and the House, and it, you know, those vary a little bit more district mm -hmm. to district, but you know, he got pushed back from the Arizona senators, from Texas uh, legislators, uh, to this idea of shutting down the border. It was gonna be incredibly complicated, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, economic impacts. Um, and so I think, but but I, it's not going away. It's something that he's going to keep pushing, you know, right up until the next November. and. But once again, an issue that Utah Republicans aren't in the mainstream with mm -hmm. Republicans on, you know, whether that's the missionary program and or, yeah. or something else that, that has that impact. I mean, it's just not a place that Utah Republicans have traditionally been as hard line on. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that, you know, certainly Utah Republicans, I don't think are excited about this issue, but is this an issue that, uh, 
Republicans generally are more excited about? Maybe from a base perspective they are, but is it going to resonate with, you know, suburban voters, people that you're that the president's going to have to turn out? Because I don't think the Democrats are going to forget Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana, some of these heartland states. There's going to be more of a focus there, even if that's not going to be where the, the fight is, is supposed to be this year. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, from what I've seen, I, I, there's been pushback from Arizona, Texas, all these border states are not real happy with the idea of shutting yeah. down the border. Order. They do want something done, and you know, and maybe the the wall is is a step in that direction. But you know, they've there's got to be a better long-term vision, a long-term policy, yeah. because as Chris kind of alluded to, if you if you go into November without without plans, it, no is not a plan, mm -hmm. and and voters are going to recognize that, and I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to go well for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay, Utah voters uh, have been, as we were discussing here, a little bit uh, in a different spot than some other in the nation, and definitely in a different mm -hmm. spot than some of those border states. Uh, what, what are Utahns on kind of this immigration reform issue in terms of, I mean, there's a little bit about who's to blame, mm -hmm. but whether or not we are gonna be one of those bright spots to try to help lead this discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people agree that that there are problems in the system. <laughs> the system needs needs some help. But I think, um, especially in, in Utah, a lot of voters, um, for various different reasons, tend to be not as hardline on immigration. They, they tend to feel, and, and the and refugees as well in that, in that same kind of right. box. You know, whether it's because there are more folks who have been to those countries on missions or or um, or, or what exactly all the reasons are, um, it's just not for here, it's not an issue that, that plays really hard. It'll be interesting to see how, what Utah kind of does. Um, for such a conservative state, of course, I feel, I talk to a lot of voters who feel at least some amount of um, uncomfortableness mm -hmm. with, with President Trump. Um, uh, and even if they uh, consider themselves very strong Republicans, a lot of them will still say, well, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. love all of that. So, um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see which, which way Utah kind of goes. When we saw last week, uh, the, the Salt Lake Chamber, other political and religious leaders sort of reiterated the support for the Utah Compact, which was a statement of principles made, I guess, about the 10 years yeah, ago right. to say, to say, you know, we are not hardliners. We're welcoming. We want, you know, we want, uh, you know, a, to, we want people to be coming here. We think it's good for our, our, our state and, and the our economy. economy. Goodness yeah. knows the Utah needs yeah. workers. Those uh, yeah. jobs are, are, yeah. are challenging to fill. So Im immigrants, I think, across the education spectrum, um, across the, the country spectrum, I think. Yeah, that's that, a great point. Because I think the the economics, this is where the border states are freaking out. The economics of the impact of any sort of on trade between Mexico mm -hmm. and those southern states would be disastrous. And that's where they're saying, no, this is a step too far. And I think Utah plays into that both because of its proximity, but also because of its need for work workforce. The tech workers, especially right mm -hmm. now, they're trying to get visas to bring tech workers in. Uh, the Silicon Slopes yeah. that we've been talk to, talked so much about over the last several years, you know, they need these people, they need to be able to bring these people in. And this is not necessarily shutting down the border and border fence, but they're also, it's, it's very difficult for them to get through these uh, through these uh, hurdles to mm -hmm. try to get to get people here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's switch gear for just a moment, but still with a little national uh, twist here. The uh, the Mueller report has come out over this last week, and Utahns are weighing in on this. People are talking about this in their homes. They're weigh, trying to weigh in on this, and we've had some very specific uh, statements from our own representatives about this one. And I want to I want to talk about the Mueller report from the Utah lens first with a tweet from our own Congressman Chris Stewart. He said. This week, far too many Democrats and members of the media claim to have evidence of collusion. They should apologize to those they have falsely accused and the American people for creating this political crisis. So, Robert. <laughs> you start with me. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I mean... I Chris Stewart is, you know, he called on Adam Schiff to resign. I think, you know, Republicans are in full offensive mode now. I think after the, after this bar summary of the Mueller report came out, there, there's, there. I, I mean, I, in another tweet, Chris Stewart said that we need to see the full report, which I think is absolutely true. We don't know exactly what it said. We know that there was not evidence of collusion, but with the obstruction of justice question is still very mm -hmm. much open, I think. There wasn't enough to prosecute, but that doesn't mean there wasn't obstruction. Um, and I think the people the people need to see it. And it's dragged on for a couple of weeks now. To where we've been waiting to for the redacted version of uh, for the Justice Department to do mm -hmm. the redactions that they think are necessary. Um, you know, I think 
all of uh, all of Utah's congressional delegation, I believe, has said that we need to see as much of the report as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I think everybody recognizes that there might be some parts of it that need to be taken out. But you know, this is you know, we're trying to put a, 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 some closure on this after two years of investigation. Um, and and Republicans, again, like you saw with Chris Stewart, I think are are going on take the mm -hmm. you know trying to go on the offensive with this. Mm -hmm. Chris, what do you make of this this political uh, part of the story that Robert? just said where like Congressman Stewart will say, you know, there's no evidence at all of collusion. You might expect the next thing would be maybe we don't need everything. But his next words were, and release the report. Right. The right. full the full report. I mean this how are those two things consistent? Well I think I I personally believe, not having seen the report, as nobody really has, with the with the exception of very few people, but I think the Attorney General Bill Barr, or Bill Barr, William Barr, has probably saved the Trump presidency uh, in terms of him being good to go for the 2020 because he set the expectations on where this report is going to come out, and I th so. I think Republicans are best served by saying, okay, now that's in the past, let's move on and focus on, you know, what we really want to run on and what 2020 is going to be about. And that would be best serve them because this report will come out in some form or fashion. And it seems to be from the reporting that, you know, it's going to be more challenging. And so if, if Republicans say, okay, let's move on, there was no collusion and focus on something else, it would be in their best interest. There was some reporting in the New York Times just the other day that said that they think that some of the staff, some of Mueller's uh, staff thought it, the bar memo mischaracterized what the report actually mm -hmm. said, but that's why I think we need to see it. And, and it's good, but at the same time, it kind of is a interesting illustration of where we are in this country yeah. because everybody sees that bar memo uh, and s views it differently. Everybody's going to read the Mueller report from their own political lens, and and it's you know they'll either believe it or they won't. Liberals forever thought Mueller was going to be you know the savior of the world for mm -hmm. them, and now now they're condemning him. And you know, and we just need to wait and see the report. Board. Interestingly, I, I think it's not really changed a lot of voters' minds. <laughs> no. Certainly what we know so far. You know, yeah. I think most people knew how they felt before. We were waiting for this. It was a big anticipation, but most people haven't really changed their minds. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's got to be the last comment. Very insightful. Thank you for the very great dialogue. Yeah. Well, that's it for this edition of the Hinkley Report. But the conversation continues online. Please go to KUED.org slash Hinkley Report to watch more of this roundtable discussion. My name is Jason Perry. Thank you and good night.